Everybody, thanks so much for coming. Um, tonight is something especially special because we have a real local um, element of this story, of this presentation, and so we have a guest, an opening act from the uh, from the Brattleboro Historical Society. Carol Farrington is going to fill us in a little bit on the background of this, just a little. <laughs> trustees of the Brown Historical Society, and of course we preserve and disseminate information <laughs> about Brownboro. And most of it comes from things that we've been given. People have given us photographs, they've given us manuscripts, they've given us artifacts, and we're running out of room, as a matter of fact. So we invite everybody to come and visit us. We're up on the third floor in the Municipal Center, which is next door. And we're there on Thursdays from 2 to 4 and Saturday from 10 to 12. So we uh, like people coming and looking, seeing what we have, trying to track down their family history, all that kind of thing. And a small tidbit on our statue, which sits in the corner over here. Of course, it was lost, actually stolen, by a group of thieves who at the same time stole two weather vanes off of the top of two barns I don't know how they did that. And a statue off the lawn of the retreat, all the same weekend. So somebody came in on a Monday night, and someone noticed on Tuesday morning that the statue was gone from the top of the fountain at the bottom of Main Street, where it had been since 1926. They don't know how they did it, but they did. So we had a very dedicated group of policemen who got together, sent out flyers, contacted police departments all up and down the East Coast, and they found it in York, Pennsylvania. The uh, antique dealers that bought it said that they intended to paint it white. <laughs> yeah. And put it on a large fountain and sell it for $1,800. Of course, this is 1976, so it was a long time ago. So, and the poor thing has had its ups and downs. It sat at the park again for a while until it got knocked off. And then the town employees stored it away for two years before someone decided that they should bring it here. So we're very lucky we have it back and we much appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And, um, I, I went over and I photocopied the file of the spirit of life and the whole story, the whole saga. And so I have um, copies of those art newspaper articles on that table if you'd like to take a look at them, including the picture of Joseph Kowalski, who um, it was his idea to bring the statue and ensconce her safely here at the library. So they have a picture of the statue and Joseph um, you know, taking up residency. So it's quite the local story. Also, having read those articles, Carol, apparently they used a helicopter to steal those weather vanes. Crazy, right? Anyway, um, that was before drones, I guess. Um, okay, so tonight, um, first of all, I want to remind everybody that next uh, next month, um, or actually June, since we're still in April, um, June we will have a first Wednesday. That's unusual, but we had a speaker who had to postpone um, a, a talk this fall, and so it's rescheduled for June 5th, and it's the new world we've, um, the wor new world we face, America alone. And um, so George Yeager will be talking to us about um, current international affairs. 
And tonight, as you know, we have a lot of people to thank for uh, making tonight happen. We have our statewide underwriters, the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation, the Wyndham Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, through the De 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 Vermont Department of Libraries. And then we have our local heroes who bring us these programs. We have Against the Grain, Brattleboro Auto Body and Detailing, Brattleboro Food Co-op, Brattleboro Savings and Loan and Park Place Financial Advisors, right across the street. New Chapter, the Richards Group and the Wyndham World Affairs Council, and of course, who? Your friends and mine, the friends of Brooks Memorial Library, really, who pulled together all the funding for this program, so we're so very grateful for them. Um, also, special thanks tonight to everyone's books who has a copy of our speaker's newest book, Monument Man, in case you would like to have one, uh, in case you would like to buy one to have signed. Uh, and um, our special thanks to Clara. Every, every month, who sets, every program, really, who sets up the sound. So, on to tonight's program. The underwriter of this talk is the Crosby Gannett Fund. And tonight, Harold Holzer, winner of the 2015 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize, is one of the country's leading authorities on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. A prolific writer and lecturer and frequent guest on television, Holzer served for six years as chairman of the Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation. For the previous 10 years, he co-chaired the U.S. Abraham Lincoln Bi Bicentennial Commission, appointed by President Clinton, and then President Bush awarded Holzer the National Humanities Medal in 2008. And, in 2013, also wrote an essay on Lincoln for the official program at the re-inauguration of President Obama. He is now co-chairman of the Lincoln Forum. He has authored, co-authored, and edited over 50 books. Again, we have this newest one. Uh, and his, which is, was just published last month, Monument Man, The Life and Art of Daniel Chester French. And that's the subject of this evening's talk. Thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for coming out tonight. We were very eager to come to New England in spring. <laughs> Not sure you kept your part of the bargain, but it's, it's, it's beautiful and uh, we're glad to be here. And of course, the Daniel Chester French story does have a rich New England connection and uh, I will get to it uh, as I talk about our hero, who you see here in later life, uh, when he was America's most famous sculptor and of course closely identified with Abraham Lincoln, with whom he's posing here. Daniel Chester French was born in New Hampshire. Uh, adorable, right? <laughs> so hair is going to be a theme of this, a subtext, because as you can see, he wound up like I did, but he started like this. <laughs> this is Dan at three, um, responding in a daguerreotype pose, very unusual for, for a surviving uh, image of a child in the daguerrean age to be smiling, because the, the exposure time was lengthy, and it was, it's hard to hold a smile, especially for a kid, but apparently the photographer held a, had a bird in a cage, and Dan was fascinated with the bird. And that's something, by the way, that will continue to be an interest of his as he gets older and begins to work professionally. Those wings are not made by someone who is unfamiliar with birds. In fact, as he grows up in Massachusetts, um, yes, he was a hunter, and um, as were many young men of the age. This is about 1863 or four. His best friend who was in this picture with him at this point is a man named William Brewster, who went on to become the most famous ornithologist in America. They were lifelong friends. They collected birds, stuffed them, kept them in Brewster's home when they were teenagers. And um, late in life, when he had a commission like the Spirit of Life, which you see here, um, he would call on his friend Will 
and ask him to send some wings, which Brewster would dislodge from whatever birds he had on hand. And, uh, and so he was always supplied with fresh models to do his angels, for which Dan French became famous. So he winds up in Concord, Massachusetts as a teenager. Um, by the way, this young man who would uh, one day become so closely identified with Lincoln kept a journal as a teenager. So the first thing we did, my wife and I, who's here tonight, when we did our initial research at Williams College, not too far from here, which has the French papers, is we looked at his diary for April 15, 1865, the date of Lincoln's death. What would he say? What, what would he see into the future, whether that would be an interest of his? Well, what do you think he wrote? April 15, 1865, saw the first ruby-tailed speckled bird of the season. So when he was interested in something, he was interested in it, and he was not yet an artist. In fact, in Concord, his father, who, had, who was a judge, also had been a college president in what is now um, UMass Dartmouth, um, sent him to MIT. He took the train to Boston, MIT was in Boston then, and he did really badly. His report card is atrocious. So he said to his father, look, I don't want to do this. I want to be a sculptor. He, all he had done until then was do a, a couple of snow sculptures um, and carve a frog out of a turnip, which he put on his dad's plate one dinner time to scare him. <laughs> and his father responded, well, you know, he feigned fright. So um, Judge French, decided to take a very analytical approach. There was a watercolor specialist and art teacher in Concord, and she's right there. Uh, her name was May Alcott. Yes, she was the sister of Louisa May Alcott and the model for Amy in Little Women. But she was the art teacher for kids, sent down to, uh, to May Alcott, and May reported back to Judge French this boy really does have talent. And with that recommendation, he was able to drop out of MIT and begin work. He goes to study with John Quincy Adams Ward in the center there, who is a sculptor whose studio is in Manhattan. He got in because of a family connection. And with a Boston painter named William Rimmer, who was there on the right. And he begins to work on some things that he thinks will be popular. Dan always had a commercial sense. He was, not, he, he was you know, inspired and filled with taste. He had a great eye, but he definitely wanted to be financially successful. Uh, kept meticulous records, and um, in fact, I don't want you to be in suspense, he made a fortune. <laughs> At the beginning, he did these cute little Parian Ware groups. Roger's groups were all the rage in those days. They were much bigger, bulkier. But he thought he could sell these little decorative pieces for the family parlor. And this was a courting scene with owls. Um, he sold it, for the rights to it, for $50 to a Boston company. The Boston company sold it to a London manufacturer. It always irritated Dan that he, for years on his trips to London, he would see these in shop windows. And he said, I can't believe I sold it for $50. Um, so in 1873 or so, it's a good looking young man. Again, keep track of the hair here. He does for sure. The town fathers of Concord decided to hatch a plan to commemorate the battle at the 100th anniversary of the battle at the Old Bridge and the battles of Lexington and Concord by commissioning a statue of one of the citizen soldiers who defended the Old Bridge, the Old North Bridge. As with many of his great successes, there was no competition. The town fathers, who included Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and, the, and the, um, the Alcott family, turned to young Dan. He was 23 years old. He had never made a statue, much less a larger than life, much less a bronze. And he won the competition. I mean, he won the commission. And he set to work on it with his father as his assistant. When they poured plaster into the clay mold, the head nearly came off because it had to be suspended upside down. He learned as he went along. He, he tried to, to 
create torsion in the legs, which was a new experience for him, because again, he never made a full length statue. So he went to visit the Apollo Belvedere at the Boston Athenaeum and began sketching this idea for a soldier in motion, at least aroused to action. And he began drawing it out. I wish he had done more drawings. This is the only preparatory drawing that survives in his entire career. But we get the idea of what he's doing. He's leaving instructions. And of course, uh, in April 1875, this miraculous piece is unveiled in Concord, Massachusetts. It is a big, big event. President Grant is in attendance, Civil War generals, descendants of Revolutionary War heroes. The only person of, oh, and Louise May Olcott comes at the last minute. I love this story because in any audience, it's a great story. She comes and she says, where am I supposed to, she walks up to the, to the main platform and she says, where am I supposed to sit? And the MC says, anywhere but here, Ms. Olcott. <laughs> and she leaves in a huff. And then the platform actually collapsed from the weight of all the people. It was an amazing event. Emerson read a poem uh, and, and the only, dignitary who wasn't there was Daniel Chester French, who, by the way, was already, he was not paid for this work. It was such a great honor. He got, he got the, uh, the cost back for his efforts. The, the foundry work was paid for by the town, but he got nothing. They later gave him a thousand dollar bonus, but he did all this just for reputation's sake, and of course, resented it later. Why wasn't he there? Well, he, oh, this is one of the bronze reductions that he made later. He did make money on the project uh, by producing smaller bronze copies, as he did with The Spirit of Life. Um, he, uh, he was in Florence. He had gone to Italy to study with the sculptor Thomas Ball, who was at work on a Lincoln project, interestingly. He became very close to the Ball family. There's Dan here and one of the great beards in the history of American art, <laughs> Thomas Ball, and the Ball daughters, uh, Dan develops a huge crush on Lizzie Ball, and um, she not only rejects him, but marries another sculptor, that's really bad. <laughs> but he does affect a kind of bohemian air. I don't know why he didn't go back. I mean, there was no Alitalia 747 to speed him to Boston and back, but this was a big deal, the, um, the Minuteman Commission in Concord. I think he was a little bit afraid of failure, and he preferred to sort of keep studying, wait for his father to send him his clippings, which, re which arrived eventually with all the, gr the rave reviews he received. And you know that the statue has become an, an icon. I mean, it is an icon for war bonds, for the NRA, for... Uh, the, the American military. I even found a, uh, an advertising piece for the first instant puddings using the Minuteman as a, as a symbol <laughs> and the slogan, where is our friend here? Ready in a minute with this. That's a long time between the straight line and the punchline, sorry about that. So here is our, here is our, our bohemian artist abroad. He studies uh, for a year and a half. Uh, his main work is this statue of Endymion, a story from mythology of a sleeping, beautiful man, beautiful young boy who is put to sleep because he's too good looking. I think Dan liked this idea because he thought he was pretty good looking as well. <laughs> and he returns to Boston, a uh, little bit older, and uh, with the European education under his belt, and as his ship approaches Boston Harbor, a, a revenue ship, a little cutter, which always comes to ocean-going vessels to pick up the mail, sidles up to his ship. And someone comes out and he hears himself being paged. Will Dan French please report to the revenue cutter? He's totally astonished. He comes downstairs and his father is in the ship, Judge French. He says, Dan, I've been named Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. And one of the perks of this office is I get this ship. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to the harbor before everybody else and go through customs. And as they're sailing, uh, steaming back to Boston ahead of the crowd, Judge French says, 
well, you're, you're educated, what did you plan to do? And Dan said, well, I, I assumed I was going home to Concord to continue work in Boston or Concord. And his father says, um, and this is Judge French, I'm now located in Washington. You should come to Washington. Open a studio there. I can open doors for you. I know all the right people now. Plus, I'm in charge of building new post office buildings and treasury buildings around the country. And all of them need decorative sculpture on top. And guess who I'll give the work to? I mean, it was an astonishing system with no competition. And apparently you could, you could do that kind of thing. To show his gratitude um, and to show how gifted he'd become, he did this bust of his wonderful father. And indeed, he got commissions to do these works for the tops of buildings. Um, and here he is in his studio working on uh, a, a group, I think it's called um, the Spirit of Industry or something, and this was going to be on top of a post office building in Boston. Still, he wasn't recognized. He was getting per diem wages for this. And he had made a triumph in the Minuteman, and his career, with the Minuteman, his career is obviously not going forward as he expected. So he makes a bold decision after a couple of years in Washington. And that is to go back to Concord on his own without his father, who stays in Washington, and to build a studio next to the family home uh, in Concord. It's still there. A family lives in it now. This family home is also owned by a family. We, we got to visit it this April. I had never seen it before. And uh, from this new studio, which he helped build with his own hands, he got another great idea. And it was relatively obvious. Others had tried it. He did the best. And that is to pose the town's most famous celebrity, Ralph Waldo Emerson, with that extravagant nose that people had been writing about for 40 years. And Emerson was a great subject for him. Uh, loved this. He said, that's the, that's the face I shave every morning. Um, I don't know what you're doing, but every day it looks worse because it looks more like me. <laughs> same, same kind of things that Lincoln said when he was sculpted from life. And another set of great reviews, a commission to make a larger statue, so he's launched again. Still, no great commissions in store. His father comes to the rescue, again, all the way from Washington. He introduces him to the son of Thomas Gallaudet. Gallaudet, the founder of the College for the Deaf in Washington, they decide they have, they have raised money for a statue um, on the, the new campus of Gallaudet, and he gets the job. And he begins working on this really inspired statue of Thomas Gallaudet and a young student who is learning, signing uh, at his, really at his side. It's quite affecting statue, and in fact, it was made in bronze, and it still stands on the campus today, beautifully restored as it happens. And um, it gave him his first experience with a famous sculptor, I know you've heard of, Augustus St. Gaudens. They were, St. Gaudens was the more famous, the more successful, slightly senior. One would think he was a whole generation apart the way he behaved toward French. Um, on this work, he interfered twice, not helpfully. On the first occasion, he, when a, a hearing impaired sculptor demanded that he get the commission and not French, after French got the commission, St. Gordon sided with the hearing impaired sculptor. That must have hurt French very much because he had gotten to know St. Gordon's. Worse was yet to come. French, by this time, has proposed to his first cousin, Mary French. Very hard to keep track of this family because there are a lot of Frenches, um, multi-generational Frenches. Practically on the eve of their June wedding in Washington, Mary was from Washington, uh, St. Gordon's calls up, well, I guess he didn't call him up, he got in touch with him and said, the legs are a little too short. French went into a tizzy and canceled, postponed his wedding. And as Mary French said, as a result, we were married in August in the hottest city in the world, Washington, D.C. So a little testy relationship with St. Gaudens. But he did get to keep the job. And this, in this way, he develops another of his early specialties. 
campus statues. This is John Harvard in its original location uh, in front of Memorial Hall. He gets the job for this, another iconic statue. And like many campus statues, he did one for Princeton, by the way, called the Christian Athlete. Every time Princeton won a football game, which was about once every four years, the students would knock over the statue. So a little bit of a history like Spirit of Life. And John Harvard, which uh, got enormous press at the time, people just marveled at the fact that he was able to do a statue of a 17th century person for whom there were no paintings or models of any kind. It just got a ton of press. Um, so this. Uh, this is a favorite gathering spot for parents uh, on tours of Harvard with their kids. It's also a favorite spot for students who've had too much beer on Friday and Saturday nights. So if you look up John Harvard on the web today, it says that um, it's venerated by day and urinated by night. So it's another one of his, that wasn't my joke, I'm just repeating what's in here. Um, Another one of his sculptures, that college sculptures that suffered, has suffered and is suffering uh, a bad fate. So did this one. This is alma mater at Columbia University. Uh, in about 1918, uh, when the Columbia Baseball Stadium was right across the road from this statue, it's now all filled in with green, uh, there's no road, uh, strapping young ball player for the Columbia team, hit a, such a tremendous home run. He was really a mama's boy. Nobody thought he could hit like this. Uh, he spoke German at home. He didn't even speak English well. Hit a ball so high and so far that it sailed over the stadium walls and landed just at the base of this statue. Can anyone guess who the player was? That's right, Lou Gehrig. Um, there'll be another Lou Gehrig connection to come. In 1969, 50 years ago, I was a 20-year-old cub reporter for a weekly newspaper in Manhattan, and the first story I covered was the bombing, the weathermen putting a bomb on this statue in an attempt to destroy it during the campus uprisings in Columbia. It only damaged the chair, uh, which was bad enough, so the president of Columbia, to punish the students, removed the art from the campus. <coughs> it was off site for years, and when it returned, it was no longer a gold leaf statue, it's now bronze, and there it sits undamaged today. So clearly he needed another specialty, and he got it in Civil War statues. This is General Joseph Hooker in Boston, and these dedication ceremonies were huge public events. This is the crowd outside City Hall in Boston for the dedication of the Hooker. You see the statue here. And Ulysses S. Grant for Philadelphia, a rather unappreciated, I think, masterpiece. And maybe his best Civil War sculpture, uh, symbolic tribute with echoes of what will come with the spirit of life, by the way. Um, a tribute to three brothers in his native Concord who had died during the Civil War. One in battle, one in the hospital, one in Andersonville. And it's called Morning Victory. It's the symbol of the country with holding a laurel wreath uh, draped for mourning. And it, was the, it is the centerpiece at, this, at the beautiful Concord Cemetery uh, where it's being renovated now. I think this is a shot of it's being installed because you see the foundation laid bare here. Worth a visit if you've not been to Concord. In the 1890s, St. Gaudens was offered the chance to be the leading sculptor of the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. He turned it down and he recommended French, I guess to make up for the wedding delay. And Daniel Chester French got to do this towering 135 foot statue um, called the Republic. It was meant to compete with the Statue of Liberty. I think it comes up a little short, not in height, but in achievement. But it was wildly popular then. It had a crown that lit up at night with electric light. Um, it was in a lagoon off Lake Michigan. And, uh, but it was made of burlap coated with glycerin and plaster, as was the whole so-called white city. Not a great thing to have in Chicago in the wind. And you can imagine what happened 
this statue burned down in the lagoon. Um, he did make a copy that was unveiled in Chicago in 1915 for the 100th anniversary of statehood in Illinois. But it's in an obscure park. But, and it's gilded. I'm not crazy about the gilded statues, but it's gilded. The good news here for French is that while it's been in a traffic circle ignored for 100 years, guess what's rising now, right, or will be rising right behind it? The Obama Presidential Center. I guess it's not technically a library. So one day this statue will sit a gilded version will sit in front of the, um, the Obama Library in Chicago. By this time, um, French wants to emulate his mentor, competitor, friend, frenemy, I guess, uh, St. Gaudens in another way. St. Gaudens has, a, as you may know, a gorgeous country estate and studio in New Hampshire. French stayed there. He wants one of his own. He looks all over. He thinks up this way is a little too north for him. He wants to be on the axis between Boston and New York. So they finally settle on this farmhouse in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, he buys it for the view, not for the farmhouse, because he soon hires Henry Bacon, who is the young architect, who was the principal designer of the White City in Chicago, to design this replacement. Um, <laughs> I, I always say this looks a little grander than it is. It's pretty grand, but if you've never been to Chesterwood uh, in, in uh, Stockbridge, it's really worth a view. This is how a sculptor of his stature wanted to live in the 1890s. And Bacon also designed his beautiful studio and presentation room in which French set right to work on an equestrian statue of George Washington for Paris. Um, it's now in front of the uh, Guimet Museum, the Asian Art Museum in Paris at the Place d'Iena. And uh, a friend of mine just sent back a camera shot, uh, which I didn't include in the show because I got it too recently. Um, the Yellow Vest folks have put a French flag, a tricot, right at the top of the sword. I have no idea how they got there. They must have used the same helicopter they used <laughs> for the spirit of life. One more commission worth noting um, is, uh, two continents, America and Africa, sleeping Africa, uh, of four in front of the U.S. Custom House, still standing in lower Manhattan. By the way, uh, he never did a Confederate statue, so we don't have to worry about that. But in terms of Americans having second thoughts about their statues, it might be worth noting that this building rose in exactly the spot where once stood a giant lead statue of King George III on horseback. And on the day that the Declaration of Independence was read aloud to New Yorkers, can you imagine that? It wasn't tweeted, it was read in the street. Um, the in New Yorkers were so aroused by what they heard that they tore down the lead statue of King George, they chopped it to bits, and they used the lead for bullets to fight the British. So there is a history of iconoclasm in the United States. Okay, total hair loss, I'm happy to say. And by the way, I wouldn't obsess about it um, if he didn't obsess about it. He wrote to his friends and his, his uh, ex fiancees mother, oh, my hair is dwindling, and you know, he thought it was the end. But um, very, I think he looks wonderful this way. Okay. <laughs> The reigning Lincoln image of the day is St. Gordon's um, image uh, in Chicago, uh, a great sculpture. French gets the commission to do a centennial of Lincoln statue in Nebraska, and he goes to work and produces this masterpiece, his first Lincoln. Henry Bacon designs the slab in the back with the words of the Gettysburg Address, sort of presaging what he will do in Washington later. When they brought this model to Lincoln, Nebraska, which is where this is, a lady came up to him while the model was still veiled and said, oh, Mr. French, I saw Mr. Lincoln. I saw him speak in Illinois. I wish you had asked me first, somehow found me, because I know that before he gave all of his speeches, he would stand on the platform with his hands clasped in front of him and his head bowed, and he would rest that way until there was complete silence, and then he would look up and begin speaking. And they unveiled the statue, the model, and the woman came back and said, you're too young to have seen him. He just intuited it, and this is the great success 
that brought him into the Lincoln community. So between Lincolns, what did he do? Well, I think you all know he began working on this amazing commission. Um, a masterpiece of symbolism, um, and uh, it was made for, the original was made to decorate a fountain in a new town that um, had sulfur water but nothing else going for it, but the town fathers really wanted to make it a tourist attraction, Saratoga, New York. And one of the residents who had helped <coughs> Uh, produced this momentum to make it a tourist attraction was a guy named George Foster Peabody, a Wall Street financier, a philanthropist, who was killed in a train wreck before his time. So his widow um, and his old business par partner commissioned a statue. Um, um, and, and this is the work that I'm sorry, it was Trask, Spencer Trask died in the train wreck. George Foster Peabody was his business partner, and he, did, he commissioned the work with Mrs. Trask, the widow. Um, this was not French's original idea. Originally, he wanted a kind of a morose figure. Mrs. Trask objected to it, I think also because it was topless. She wasn't ready for that. <laughs> so he did this draped figure holding a, uh, a, a, a pan in one hand, you see the pan there to symbolize the eternal springs of Saratoga and a laurel wreath in her, an oak leaf in her other hand. And sadly, the oak has not come back to Brattleboro, but maybe one day you can get an oak leaf added. And here he is working on the full-scale model at Chesterwood. Here he is working on it outdoors. His studio had, the sculpting platform was on a railroad car and on tracks. So before he would submit a work, he would have it moved out onto the railroad track so he could see how it would look outdoors and would work on the final details outdoors. I guess he used that little stool at the foreground to get up to the platform outdoors, but he was a, a nimble fellow, right? Um, he got $25,000 for this work in 1915 and then set about making uh, copies. Here it is in Saratoga. It's been... Um, cleaned and restored a couple of times. And then he set to work on these copies. And um, as you've heard from the introduction, uh, one of the copies came to Brattleboro in 1924. It's had a tough time, but it's back. And um, here's another version. It was enormously successful. I'll tell you one tragedy about it. The model for this statue was I guess you'd call her America's first supermodel. Her name is Audrey Munson. They said that at one point, 10% of all the sculptures of beautiful women in the United States were modeled on her, including the Liberty Dime, by the way, if anybody has an old 10 cent piece, that's Audrey Munson. She was also the first silent screen star to appear nude in films. Now there's an achievement worth <laughs> noting. So she was a model, and that's how she made her money. Tragic ending. When she was in her 30s, she was involved in some horrible scandal and shooting, and she lost it. She became schizophrenic and depressed. Her mother committed her for treatment to, a, to an asylum. She was in the asylum for 65 years. She never left, and she died at the age of 104. And that's the model for your statue. Just thought you should know, full disclosure. So by this point, St. Gaudens is dead. French is the established greatest living American sculpture. He's also the chairman of the National Commission for the Fine Arts, appointed by President Taft. Here he is with a bunch of grumpy old white men at, the, <laughs> at a board meeting. But they have an important task. After 40 years of deliberation and delay, Congress is finally financing a Lincoln Memorial in Washington. It had been talked about since 1865 when Lincoln died. French is the head of the commission that has to approve it. How he gets to be the sculptor is a fascinating story. And the fact that there was never anyone else in contention is a fascinating story. It's the Minuteman all over again. The real debate was about where to put the Lincoln Memorial, and it may look like it's in the perfect spot to you, but at the beginning, the choices included Union Station in Washington. That's how it looked when it was first built. The base of the Capitol, 
which instead got a Ulysses S. Grant statue. Lincoln's summer home outside of Washington. They, find they wisely decided it was too remote. The Naval Observatory, I thought an aerial view of an observatory was a good idea, which Lincoln frequented during his presidency. Someone even suggested Meridian Park. Uh, the problem was there was a seated president in Meridian Park already, James Buchanan, so that did not seem like a great idea. The Speaker of the House at the time was this fierce looking fellow, and he was fierce, not as fierce as Nancy Pelosi maybe, but very fierce, and he said, they all said, look, none of these sites work. Let's fill in the mall with the Washington Monument on one side and let's put the Lincoln Memorial on the other. And he said, I will never let a memorial to Lincoln, whom he had seen too in his youth, to be built in that goddamn swamp. And it was a swamp. He said, if you insist on putting it there, I'm gonna propose Arlington, Robert E. Lee's mansion, even though it was on the Confederate side of the Potomac River. So the debate went on, wiser heads finally prevailed, and they indeed, once Cannon left the speakership and actually lost his congressional seat, that's how they got him out, um, they chose West Potomac Park, and it was not an easy place to build. Um, Henry Bacon, French's old friend, the man who designed his, uh, his home, was the architect of choice. He originally was urged to save money Oh, here's, of course, the temple that he designed. And he was urged to save money by doing a, a reproduction of the St. Gaudens in Chicago. And as you can see, he sketched it out. So he was part of that conspiracy. But wiser heads prevailed. Uh, French launched a campaign to, to arguing two things. One, no reproduction for this place. It's too sacred. It's too important. And then number two, no standing statue because it should be a statue that a visitor can see face to face from the bottom step. And it was a convincing argument. So he got the job. Um, again, no competition. And the most important commission in American history, really, in terms of sculpture. He went to work. And there's Bacon doing an early look at it. He went to work looking at existing Lincoln photographs sent to him by the leading Lincoln expert of the day. He consulted the life mask of Lincoln made in April, March or April 1860. Those nails in there were driven by French so he could keep measurements of the distance between the forehead and the chin. He used the hands of Lincoln, sculpted shortly after he was nominated for the presidency, and then sculpted his own hands. It's a nice look at the, his daughter said he had beautiful, beautiful hands, which he scrubbed of clay every day before coming to family dinner. So it's a nice little touch to have. The rest of it is a mystery. I mean, how did he do it? I don't know how artists work. I've written about artists for 40 years, but their talent astonishes me and mystifies me to this day. Um, we know he's not Michelangelo. He doesn't carve from a block of marble. He makes clay models. He enlarges them, he makes plaster copies of his clay, he makes a larger copy, and then he sends the result to marble cutters, stone cutters, or foundries. That's how St. Gordon's work, that's how French work. But somehow, within a few months of getting this commission, he has this three foot clay, and he's already got it. He's got the throne, he's got the hands, he changes the legs, he's back to that downcast look, and he, sends for Henry Bacon, we know who the senior partner was in this enterprise, and he says, come up to Chesterwood, I think I've got the design. And then he makes a three-foot model, and he writes down the dimensions he envisions. Now he's got the legs, as you see, switched to the way they will be in the final sculpture with the right leg thrust forward. And from that, a six-foot model. Um, and as you can see, he's got the original model, he's He's proud of, he tucks it in under the coat for this posed photo. Then he goes down to DC to see the finished building. He goes into the atrium and he says, uh-oh, I paraphrase, this, this interior is much vaster than I thought. I'm planning a 13-foot statue. It'll be dwarfed in here. I've made a terrible mistake. But he had the eye to realize it, so he goes 
to Congress and he says, I've got to make it 19 feet, not 13 feet. And it's marble, so it, instead of $50,000, it's going to cost the taxpayers $75,000. And they said, no, not so fast. He very wisely made a plaster head in the dimensions of a 19-foot sculpture. And he took it to Washington. He had it hauled up on a rope from the position it would be in and invited Robert Lincoln, Lincoln's surviving son, to come and look, and then a series of congressional leaders. And they reluctantly agreed, you're right, this has to be it. By the way, this model survives in the New York Historical Society today. So then, I guess Lou Gehrig part two, he takes the model or ships it to the Bronx, only a few blocks from where Yankee Stadium would rise a couple of years later. And there, these astonishing craftsmen named the Picciarilli brothers, Italian immigrants, marble carvers for generations, begin to work on the marble. And a magazine went there to watch them work on the head from that plaster model. They had the, the six-foot model in the Bronx. French would go up all the time to work on it with them, to make uh, details uh, cleaner, and to share in the macaroni lunches that one of the brothers made every day. It was made in 28 blocks of Georgia marble. They were never assembled for a test until they were shipped to Washington. And there, for the first time, they were assembled in the atrium of the Lincoln Memorial. Here you see Henry Bacon watching as some of the pieces were hauled up and then assembled, after which French would scamper, oh, he's 70 years old now, scamper up this ladder and this ladder and work on elements of it that he thought were needed revision. It stood there for a couple of years, and in 1922, on Memorial Day, about 75,000 people gathered on the mall and this is the, the crowd that's assembled to watch Chief Justice William Howard Taft announce the dedication of the statue and to watch as he handed it off to President Harding here. There's Robert Lincoln sitting right on top of the porch. That may be French, but I'm not sure. He may be behind a pillar. And there was one other speaker of note that day, and that brings to mind the story that I begin my book with, because I think it's an important thing for us to remember, that the dedication was not what it should have been. Robert Russell Moulton, the principal of the Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington's successor, was invited to, quote, represent his race at the dedication. But when he, he had to submit his speech in advance to the Harding administration, and in the speech he said something like, until Lincoln's work is finished, his unfinished work is finished, this memorial cannot really be dedicated until there's full equality and opportunity. And the Harding people said, well, you can't say that. Uh, that's just not pleasant. <laughs> he said, but that's what I want to say. And they said, well, you have two choices. Either take that stuff out or don't speak. So he gave a censored speech. But that wasn't the worst part. African Americans arrived that morning early to get good seats for this dedication of a, of a tribute to a person still beloved in the African American community. At midday, uh, mounted police rousted them out of their seats and pushed them to the back of the crowd on backless benches and replaced them with aging Confederate veterans in uniform. This was a moment of sectional reconciliation, not racial reconciliation. One of the people who just stood up and walked out was the first black Rhodes Scholar, who I mentioned in the book. If you read the reviews of the statue, the white press, the daily press, the traditional press raves about the Lincoln Memorial. But if you read W.E.B. Du Bois or the New York Age, they say it's not a legitimate dedication. It still isn't legitimate. But that's what we were left with, the old white leaders standing in front of the old, the white marble columns in a lily white ceremony, Harding, Robert Lincoln, and Joe Cannon. One technical thing before I tell you about the sea change in the image is that it was beautiful. It may have hurt people, but it was beautiful. French noticed, however, that during the, a period of a year when he was in Europe, they had decided to keep the doors open all the time. And they had plastered over, or actually 
put a layer of something over the skylight. So at night, it looked as it did on the left. And French very wisely got GE to do a lighting study and then add electric lights. Sculpture is all about lighting in the end. Um, and he made sure it was right. But for 17 years, the Lincoln Memorial was a tribute to the white man's version, vision of Lincoln and the idea of sectional reconciliation. All that changed in 1939 at last, thanks to a woman in whose New York City home I get to work in now every day at the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute in Manhattan. Uh, the singer Marian Anderson was scheduled in 1939 to sing at the Daughters of the American Revolution. They said, no African Americans allowed in our auditorium. Eleanor Roosevelt said she should sing at the Lincoln Memorial. And on Easter Sunday, 80 years ago this month, Marian Anderson sang to a fully integrated crowd of 50,000 in the rain. You can still hear it if you find it on YouTube, that Easter Sunday concert. Immediately, the image of the Lincoln Memorial changed from a statue, a good statue, to a symbol of national aspiration. Um, enhanced that same year, thanks to Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, because he, to get inspiration, he goes to the Lincoln Memorial and watches a little boy read the Gettysburg Address that's etched on the wall as an older African-American man cries. Um, and that scene remained in the film, despite objections in the South, and helped codify the Lincoln Memorial status as a place of inspiration. Uh, and that's what it has remained ever since for the last 80 years. Uh, of course, no event, oh, you know, I, I left out my little segue, uh, a, a place of um, where foreign dignitaries also identify with Lincoln in their mysterious ways. Do you know, anyone know who this is? That's right, it's Fidel Castro visiting. And of course, in that's 61, this is 1963. The Lincoln Memorial again changed dramatically and forever as the ending point of the 1963 March on Washington. These are the civil rights leaders gathered here for the event. Whitney Young, A. Philip Randolph, Dr. King, Roy Wilkins, and I think, that's right. Somebody just said, before I could ask, you got it. That's that handsome young man is Congressman John Lewis, who was one of the managers of the march. Um, and of course, the highlight moment, the I Have a Dream speech, in which, if you read the text, Dr. King started the speech by saying, I'm standing in the symbolic shadow of the man who 100 years ago announced the Emancipation Proclamation. So again, uh, today there's a tablet on the top step, which is almost as popular a selfie spot as the memorial itself. And uh, over the years it has this talismanic um, urgency to leaders, whether they're in a moment of great pride or great distress. Richard Nixon made two famous visits to the memorial. Once his famous encounter with anti-war demonstrators, which was photographed by an amateur photographer. There are no White House photographs of Nixon meeting hippies, which is a treasure of a picture. And of course, he went back two years later um, to sort of commune with Lincoln right before he resigned. More recently, it's the place where presidents-elect make their final appearance before their inaugurations. The Lincoln Memorial is the backdrop for the transitions to new leaders of all parties. And also uh, a symbol of national mood. The Lincoln Memorial itself has been used to communicate. Um, this is Bill Molden's famous cartoon about the death of President Kennedy. Maybe the first time the memorial was used to demonstrate uh, national mood. There are about 20 fist bump cartoons with President Obama. And I'm always asked, is there a cartoon about the Lincoln Memorial responding to the election of President Trump? It's not a partisan cartoon, it's just about astonishment. So here's the cartoon, the Lincoln Memorial the day after the election. 
<laughs> French visited many times. Robert Lincoln visited many times. I want to end with the words from one visitor, which I find very moving. Um, in about 1926, a Washington busboy. He had been working as a historian's assistant, but he, he couldn't keep the job. It paid too little. But he was about to enroll in the traditional black college, Lincoln University, appropriately enough, where he would study alongside Thurgood Marshall. So this busboy went to the Lincoln Memorial one more time before shipping out to school. And in 1926, this is what Langston Hughes wrote about that visit. Let's go see old Abe sitting in the marble and the moonlight, sitting lonely in the marble and the moonlight, quiet for 10,000 centuries, old Abe. Quiet for a million, million years. Quiet and yet a voice forever against the timeless walls of time, old Abe, for which we thank not only the great poet Langston Hughes, but the great sculptor Daniel Chester French. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. So, does anybody have anything to say to ask Kit? Thank you. Is there a connection? or a statue with French to Exeter, New Hampshire? I don't think so. He did a few New Hampshire pieces, his birthplace state, um, but no, I don't think. There's a Daniel Webster up there somewhere. I'm not sure if it's Exeter. Of course, you can get the book and check Exeter. <laughs> I wish I knew specifically. He did a few pieces. You know, he did some New England pieces. He did Flanders Fields up here in World War I, but I'm not sure about a direct exeter. Does anyone have a question I actually know the answer to? I guess that's leading a suggestion. Yes, Mike is coming. Oh, well, first to comment, um, I went to Ball State University, and there's a huge St. Beneficence mm -hmm. statue that he did, that if you stood under the left wing, you were uh, engaged. engaged. Or kissed a girl or something like right. that. Yeah, that's supposedly true with alma mater too. If, if um, courting couples can find the owl that uh, he, in, he hid in the drapery of alma mater, then they become engaged. And that's another college campus uh, statue, and it's a tribute to one of the philanthropists of Ball State. Well, so you, you remember it from? I remember it from Ball State, but I also went to Columbia, and I didn't get married either place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a question. Oh, you didn't hear about the curse. If you see both statues. <laughs> it must be what happened. Yeah. Um, I have a question about, you, if I understand right, once they got the Lincoln uh, statue in the memorial, it was carved of marble. Right. You said he would crawl up and make adjustments. And what kind of adjustments did he make? Carving? So polishing and a little bit of extra carving, scoring. He would make lines in the marble. If you get really close to it, you can see scratches in certain surfaces, which he believed highlighted or highlit certain areas. So that's all he could do with marble. But he also did work on the individual blocks. All 21 of them had sculpting on them. Seven were interior pieces. The inferior marble was put inside. But he, you know, he did work piece by piece, but not until it was assembled in the memorial could he judge the height and how it would look from the ground and how it would look from the bottom step. And he was a perfectionist and he went up and did so the polishing, the scoring, a little bit of scraping. Look closely next time, you'll see those, those lines. Thank you. How were those pieces assembled, pieces of marble? Were they bolted or pinned? They're not any of the above. They are just placed. They fit. Uh, so don't push. <laughs> don't exhale. Um, they are piece by piece and then 
their seeming cement. They may have been a little cement um, in a little grout, and then they were grouted around the edges. And then French, that's another um, uh, effort he did, is to make us, make the grout invisible to the naked eye. So to polish the grout so it appeared the same um, patina as the marble. So, you know, it's just lying there, head, held by its own weight. Yes. Hi, I was wondering, uh, did he, when, when he traveled to Italy, did he come into contact with Larkin Mead, who is another mm -hmm. local area sculptor? He, he, he came in contact with Larkin Mead. Um, he, he was a, really in the, net, in the uh, power, Hiram Powers, uh, Thomas Ball School. So, but he did know Mead, and of course Mead, Mead did a Lincoln as well. And they were, they were all competitors. There was a, uh, there was a competition uh, after 1911, there was a newspaper competition about which is the greatest sculpture of Lincoln. And the top three finishers were uh, St. Gaudens, Mead, and French, which he was not, on, he was not very happy about. But it was pre-Lincoln Memorial, it was Nebraska. Yeah, he knew all of them. He was on, he was, I should say, he was, he was on the board of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. When John Quincy Adams Ward died, he was like the, the what's the word, not symbolic, but the, the representative, what do you call it when it's token, thank you, Edith, the token Americanist on the board of the Met. The Met was all about classical art in the 19th century, and they didn't care about American art, so they figured they would let an artist be on the board. There were a few artists on the board. Um, when Ward, who was French's early teacher, died, they appointed French, and he transformed the place. He became the American art curator, de facto curator, because there was no sculpture curator. He acquired sculpture for the Met, including his own, which you could say, oh, I must not be involved, but it's, I'll give you a discount. Um, <laughs> so beautiful sculpture called Memory, which was on view in New York, was bought by the other trustees. He acquired hundreds of St. Gaudens works. He staged the first special exhibition of sculpture in the history of the Metropolitan Museum, dedicated to St. Gaudens. Um, he went to Europe, scouted European sculpture, so he was deeply involved with the whole community of American sculptors. And as far as I can tell, he encouraged everybody. Women sculptors, he was encouraging of women. Um, the only one he didn't like is Gutzon Borglum, the one who did the Mount Rushmore. Because he, he, uh, French was chairing a meeting in a club in New York and Borglum stood up and said, I, I must interrupt and uh, point of order and French never forgave him. <laughs> whatever, it, whatever it takes. <laughs> but Mead, yes, definitely. Thank you, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, why are the papers, the archival documents, uh, primarily stored at, I believe you said Williams, and the, uh, I guess that's uh, Northwest uh, Massachusetts. Thank you. So um, all of the papers remained at Chesterwood, um, French's home. He had one daughter, a sculptress, I shouldn't say sculptress, a sculptor, who uh, not a Tremendously successful one, but you know, one who had it, who, was, who exhibited. She kept the home. She married, she had no children. She lived there until she died. And she worked really hard to collect plaster models and bronze copies, uh, reuniting them at, at Chesterwood. If you, I'm getting to the papers, I promise. A little advertisement for Chesterwood. If you go there, you'll see the working models for the Lincoln Memorial uh, and for the Minuteman and for the Continents. They're all back in his barn which French ordered moved up the hill so he could build his studio. And the studio itself has a lot of models in it. Um, all of the correspondence just stayed at Chesterwood. Well, I would say half. Some of the French family papers were donated to the Library of Congress. So those originals are there. A copy of everything, plus a ton of further originals, all of the things that French wrote while he was in residence, at Chesterwood, and from 1896 to 1931, he spent five and a half months a year at, in Stockbridge. So they were just there. They were stored under the barn first floor level, and that's not great for papers. So eventually, the National Trust, uh, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation acquired Chesterwood, 
and they have been working ever since to preserve everything, including some of the statuary stored under there too. They decided to give the originals to the Chapin Library at Williams College, and that's why the papers are there, a matter of preservation. Copies are all at Chesterwood for, for scholars um, who want to see them there, but the originals are, you know, in climate control, controlled conditions. It's a long way around to that answer. Right, next. Yes. Um, first of all, I thought your talk was excellent. Thank I, you. I really appreciate it. Um, next comment. Oh, well, you have <laughs> I was at um, uh, Columbia during the student strike in 1968, and you might, uh, you might find it amusing that uh, on the first or second morning of the strike, the, uh, Columbia is um, alma mater sits in the middle of the campus, right. and around the corner, if you will, uh, it, it, it connected by very nice brick paths, is a, a statue of Alexander Hamilton mm -hmm. standing up in front of, of all places, Hamilton Hall. <laughs> and uh, on the first or second morning of the strike, somebody had. Um, painted yellow footprints, starting with Alexander Hamilton's statue, um, down the pedestal, on the brick path, around the bend, and to the center of campus, to the feet of alma mater, and these yellow print, uh, these yellow footprints uh, were painted, and then two large yellow hand Prince on her breasts. <laughs> so somebody put that on there, and it was that was part of the, um, the gestalt of the strike. <laughs> I wish I had interviewed you for that to do that anecdote. It was. I don't know if anybody ever took a picture of it, but I remember it vividly because you know, it's hard to find pictures of the damage. Um, I searched in vain. There's one picture of Abby Hoffman stand, holding on, dangling from the statue to give a speech with a bullhorn. So maybe you were there when Abby Hoffman. No, I don't remember Abby there. I remember Tom Hayden there. He was in the president's office where I was. But oh, you were but, striking in the president's office. Wow. Well, the first morning, I didn't. I I was a day tripper. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't in it for the duration. But, but, uh, but I remember the delightful sense of, uh, of freedom of those yellow footprints at, at, the, at the alma mater. But just it was. Um, it was just uh, something real different and lovely. Part of the <laughs> spirit of the 60s. All I can tell you is that I will use that story next time I use, do a speech on Daniel Chester. <laughs> it's priceless. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. I guess there's no topping that. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Thank you. There are copies of Monument Man for sale here, and I'm sure Professor Holson would be happy to write his name in it. Um, please do take a look at the newspaper clippings about the escapades here. And um, also, if you have feedback for Vermont Humanities Council about First Wednesdays or about this particular presentation, please do take a feedback form. You don't have to fill it out here. You can bring it back later and pick up uh, an announcement of next the next program, which will happen in June. Okay, let's go have some school weather. <laughs>